correction from the presentation last time. Uh, uh -oh. Some, oh yeah, somebody somebody made a comment when I had the table up there about the amino acids um, uh, as they are translated from the uh, nucleotide sequence, the triplet code sequence. Somebody asked whether they're 21 amino acids rather than 20, which I had stated. So after the presentation, I went back and checked, and sure enough, he's right. There are 21 uh, common amino acids. So I have changed that slide accordingly, and I uh, offer my mea culpa for that uh, error. And so there we go. So I thank you. Right, just a that. second. I'm going to call the police and tell them not to stop by. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's a good point. Um, actually, last time we, we um, we ended at a pretty good spot. Um, if you recall, I was, I was there were three aspects of the CRISPR presentation that I wanted to talk about. Uh, the first one was CRISPR itself, what it means, clustered regular, uh, regularly interspaced uh, short palindromic repeats. And so I had gone through that, where it comes from, uh, the immune system from bacteria have made that as part of their genome. Um, and then secondly, we talked about how the term CRISPR now has been expanded. So it's no longer, uh, doesn't mean just what the acronym itself says, but also takes into account the proteins, the so-called CAS systems, CAS is CRISPR associated system. Um, it takes into account the CAS system. And so whenever anybody uh, is talking about CRISPR in the, in the uh, uh, popular media, or papers or anything like that. That's what they're talking about. They're talking about the whole thing. They're not talking about just the sequences. Uh, and today we're gonna to get into the genetic engineering aspect, which I think most people, that was the punchline. That's what they wanted to talk about. So we're gonna get into that today. Um, to do that, I wanna give a brief review. And the review I'm gonna do is the, is the last slide I gave last time. And I'm gonna go through that slide and, so that we got our neurons firing on the same wavelength there, and hopefully we're all at the same place when I get to, to the genetic engineering aspect of it. So we start off up here with the first thing, which is the Cas system, Cas proteins. There are, in, in this particular Cas, there's more than one Cas system, but in this particular one, there are two major lobes, the rec lobe or recognition lobe, and the nuc lobe, which is the nuclease, nuclease is going to be cleaving the covalent bonds that hold the DNA polymer together. Within these lobes, there's one particular one they're showing here, and that's one that cleaves one of the uh, uh, DNA polymers. Actually, it's the one that's being being sought. And then the and the other region here is a, is a so-called disorder TAM region. In other words, there's a region in this particular lobe that hasn't really formed, fully formed itself. Um, it's going to become the PAM region. Now, PAM is, stands for protospacer, um, a pro protospacer ad ad adjacent motif. Boy, I'm forgetting the, the, the uh, acronyms here. Anyway, that's what that stands for. We'll get to, get to a little bit more about that when we go on. Um, so what happens is that this, this is sitting out in the cell, in the bacterial cell, and a particular RNA comes along. Um, it has been uh, formulated from, from previous phage in, invasions. And in the particular case we're talking about here, this one has been genetically engineered, okay? So now this, this SG stands for signal. Sometimes you'll see this G as guide. And this is what it looks like. It has part of the CRISPR and it also has the, the um, tracer. Now tracer stood for trans CRISPR RNA. So we're really getting into the acronyms. Trans because the, this particular RNA sequence came from the opposite strand, the, the complementary strand of the so-called signal strand or the one that, that is being sought, okay? So that's what this is. And then at the end of actually the tracer strand, you have the sequence. I, I can't make the pointer work real well when I'm in, um, uh, in this app. Anyway, 
this is the sequence that's going to be used to try to figure out where on the target uh, DNA we want to land. So that's all one RNA sequence, one big sequence. And this has been engineered now. This has been genetically engineered. They've joined, they've joined this together so that there's one big polymer. Now, the PAM system is now being formed because we have this in here. So now this is being formed. Uh, the PAM system now looks for the target. The target is shown here, double-stranded sequence. This is the target strand. So, so are you saying that the presence of the signal RNA triggers the formation of the PAM site? Yeah. What happens in, in all proteins, this is very common in, in um, protein biochemistry. Proteins have different conformations. They're changing conformation all the time. And, and most of the things that happen that are of biological relevance happens when something is interacts with those proteins. They'll change their conformation. So now it can go on, the, the protein now will go on and, and perform some other function. And something else will come on. We'll see it happen here. Something else will happen. That'll change the conformation even different. And you'll have three or four of it. And this particular one, this is a pretty complex system. So there's four or five different changes that occur in those proteins. Yeah, so that's what happens. But this is true of most proteins in, in the body. They do change conformation a lot. And this has been studied now for, uh, when I started looking at this, 1960s, this is just really being studied how this conformational change changes how the proteins um, change their function and what happens to them. Otherwise, they just sit out there. They don't do anything. So, okay. Uh, so anyway, so now it interacts with the target uh, DNA here and starts to do something. And what it's looking for, the first thing it's looking for is the PAM sequence. In this specific case, the PAM sequence is only three nucleotides. Very short. So if you're thinking in terms of uh, several billion nucleotides in a given genome, having three randomly of the, of, of the particular um, sequences as, as shown here, that's gonna uh, occur quite commonly. But what's good about this is that, or what's, what's, been, what's unique and what is very, very um, telling about this particular system is that it's constantly monitoring. So it's looking for it. And that's, then in, <clears throat> if it doesn't find it, then it goes on. And it doesn't find it, it goes on. So this thing really moves around on the sequence. Once it, once it encounters the DNA, it really moves up and down the sequence looking for this first. Um, okay. Now I said before, you don't pay attention to this H and H here. It's not part of this, even though it shows it on this cartoon. That's not part of it. it sits behind the sequence. So it's not part of it. This nucleation site. Okay. What's going on here is that we're looking for a place to actually cleave the DNA. So what's, what's happening is that the, is the site again is behind on this nucle on this nucle lobe sits behind here. All right, so it's looking for the PAM region. Uh, the PAM that we talked about last time was NGG, N being any of the bases or nucleotides, G being guanine. So that's pretty common. So you're gonna see a lot, it's gonna show up a lot. This PAM sequence is on the complementary or non-target strand. The PAM sequence that's looking for is not on the target strand. I mean, it's just the way the biology, the way the bacteria have done it for their CAS system. So it's looking down here. Okay, let's say, let's say that it doesn't happen. Again, what I've said is that it associates, we go back and look for some more. Let's say that it does now, it does associate. Now what happens is that the so-called interrogation, now it's beginning to look at this portion of the uh, tracer uh, CRISPR strand. And this is called the seed region here. The seed region then is looking to see whether it can, it can hydrogen bond with these um, uh, nucleotides on the target region. Um, what what, what do the five prime and the three prime mean? Okay, yeah. We didn't talk about that last time we were getting, but since we've got some time here, let me go through that a little bit. Um, 
typically when when one is talking about the genetic code, remember there are two strands and the five prime, three prime really refer to the hydroxyl group that's on the deoxyribose. Okay, it's just, that's an organic chemical nomenclature. Um, and so the five prime is, is where the reading starts when you're starting to form RNA from DNA, or when you're trying to, to make the second strand of DNA from the, from the first strand. You're reading from, it's, it's read five prime to three prime. Uh, and again, if you wanna know where that prime is, you have to look at the sugar at the deoxyribose and where the hydroxyl group, the free hydroxyl group lies on it. So uh, when DNA is formed, uh, let's say we start from the five prime, remember you have the sugar, we have the base, and then there's a phosphate. Uh, the phosphate comes off the three prime end of that sugar. So there's, so there's two oxygens on the sugar. One is called the five prime, one is the three prime. Again, that's where it's located on that sugar. That's where that comes from. When you get to the strands themselves, then since we have the strands being complementary, then if one reads five prime to three prime in this direction, the complementary strand is going to read five prime to three prime in that direction. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Yes. Okay, <laughs> I wanted one of those anyway. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's what happens because of the complementarity here and because, uh, uh, firstly, because of the way it's being read when, when the polymerase or the enzymes that take, the, 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 the common enzymes that, that yeah. chew and up the DNA are there. That's just the direction in which those enzymes move. Um, and again, if you're, because it's complementary, uh, this is, uh, this is not being, uh, well, uh, how to say this. Uh, you can form RNA from this strand or from this strand. This is the strand, it's the coding strand. In other words, as you read it, this is the code that aligns once it's into the RNA, that aligns with the amino acids. Okay, so the complementary code is down here. And, and even though this is being read, it's nonsense because there's no amino acids that correspond if it's reading in that direction, the complementary strand. However, we will see, and this gets somewhat complicated to try to visualize this. We will see as we get further down here, uh, in, in fact, the next slide or two, that some of the reading does take place from this strand. And so there are some enzymes that use this strand, but those are, we'll get to genetic engineering. We'll see how that works. Um, what's the, what's, when you talk about the reading? Yeah. What, what are you, what are you talking about more? Mechalitin? Is it hydrogen bonding or what? No, it's actually reading the, it's actually reading the, the, the basis. The sequence of bases. If you think back, uh, if you want me, let me go back to that slide. Just got a little bit of time here. Hang on. Let's do this. Let's see. Okay. Remember this slide? Okay. This is the codon. This is the RNA. This came from the DNA. And the codon is always read in a particular sequence. The first base of the codon is on the left. The second base is, on, is at the top. And the third base, you just have to read down through each one of these. So let's take the top one first. I mean, just as an example, the first base that you come to, because you're reading in a direction, the, the, the let's, call, let's say we're making um, RNA from DNA. So, uh, this gets tough because we get over here. Anyway, let's say that we now have the RNA. The RNA has this sequence in this order. Well, let's take it this way. In this order, it has a, a uracil, a uracil, and cytosine. Okay, in that order. It's read in that order, and that will correspond to the amino acid 
phenylalanine. Phenylalanine. Now I'm not going into how the uh, protein is made, how the protein um, polymer is made from it. Um, we could spend a fair amount of time talking about that. But that's how that's how the biological system, all biological systems work. That's how all cells do it. And they read it in a particular sequence. So that's the order. When we talk about order, we're talking about a sequence. And when you come to the genome, the genome sequence is going to be a three-letter code followed by another three-letter code, followed by another three-letter code, followed by another three-letter code, and so forth. Each one of those is read and is then translated by a translation mechanism in the cell to the amino acid, the, the appropriate amino acid. And through the machinery in the cell that's doing all the reading and translating and so forth, these amino acids are hooked together by covalent bonds and eventually form the peptides, or which are small proteins or proteins. Okay, does that, does that help with... Uh, why we talk about sequences, why we talk about the order of reading sequence and so far. So we're reading five prime to three prime. Here. We're reading in that direction along the RNA. This is yeah, five prime to three seems, prime. It seems almost anthropomorphic the way you're describing it rather than, than that there's some chemistry going on. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm not gonna go into the chemistry here because we'll, we'll be here all day with just some real Oh, this going into the, into, the, into the chemistry. I'm making it anthropomorphic because that's the easiest way to understand it. But the chemistry, yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, you got to take biochemistry courses to, to really get into the actual chemistry itself. But yeah, you're absolutely 100% right. There's, there is chemistry that's going on there. Uh, and it's organic chemistry. The biological system is doing organic chemistry for you. And it's doing it well. It's doing it efficiently. Um, that's why biotech is a big thing. Uh, it, it started off really in the 1960s, really. Uh, and it really expanded. And so the last 10, 20 years, it is major you now in terms of basic research, as well as research which is in the clinics. Um, and so that's where you're being bombarded with a lot of information from uh, molecular biology uh, too, because it's really big. Uh, but, Go ahead, Carl. Dick, yes. Dick, you said that uh, it wouldn't, if it read the complementary strand, it wouldn't make any sense. But it seems that the complementary strand, I mean, if you look at the codes, uh, it, it, they will certainly code for uh, amino acids. Uh, it might have yeah. been the, the same set. Uh, That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. But if you remember, there's a start codon and a stop codon. It's got to read a start codon before it's going to, it's going to start uh, making the translation. Okay, let's say that start, let's see, the opposite of this would be uh, C-A-T. Uh, C-A-T. Chris, you don't have the T's on here. That's right. So there's no start code on there. There's no, it doesn't start. Again, biology has figured this out. So on the opposite strand, it's not going to, it's not going to read because there's nothing to start. There's no, it doesn't start with any huge new. Yeah, biology is pretty pretty sophisticated. Well, what you've got there in that table is the RNA, not the DNA. That's correct. That is correct. But the RNA is what's being translated into, into the amino acids of the proteins. And over here, I, I had gone through how you went from the genome itself um, to the RNA, which is being, which is being read. To make the protein. Now that's that's the genome. That one correspond. This is the RNA corresponding to that genome. But this RNA came from the complementary strand that was read. So there are times when the complementary strand is read. But this is now DNA to RNA. So we went 
So actually what happened is that RNA polymerase is, is how the RNA is being formed. That is being um, taken. First of all, it finds where on the DNA it wants to start to translate. In fact, it translates a lot of DNA and it, and it just isn't used. So lots of RNA out there that's, that's not being used so it gets chopped up all the time in the cells. It's not useful. But what it's doing is it's going along and it's translating, as I said, on, on, on both strands, but it's translating here. And this is the strand that's gonna be used because it comes from the complementary DNA strand. This strand was complementary to that. So this is the strand that gets translated, uh, uh, transcribed, I'm sorry, transcribed from the DNA. So now it forms the genome in the RNA form. This genome now comes over to the stable and you get the amino acid sequence of the protein. Good questions, good comments. Anything else? Probably not totally clear, but it's something you really have to spend time at, just like anything else. Um, and, and one of the comments about it, it's really chemistry is going on. Absolutely right, it is chemistry. It's organic chemistry, but the biological system's doing it. Uh, okay, now we're down here at this point. Um, if you'll notice, you're seeing an unwinding of these strands. Once the PAM has been recognized, you're seeing an unwinding. Uh, remember that the uh, DNA, the, the double-stranded DNA is held together by hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonds are much weaker than the covalent bonds, but they are bonds, so they have to be broken. It just doesn't take a lot of energy to break hydrogen bonds. It takes some, but not a lot. And so the proteins themselves well, the proteins from this cast system will actually interact with the DNA, causing it to what we say untwist. Does it untwist little... right in the middle of two strands, leaving yeah. both ends still twisted? Yeah, if you, yeah, let me, let me go back again to something, to a cartoon I had before, you know. There's the double strand. This is the Watson and Crick system. It's double stranded, it's a helix, and they're twisted together. That's the classic DNA double stranded helix. Yes, they are, they are together as a helix. Yeah, but, but I'm surprised that you can sort of untwist in the middle without untwisting the ends. Oh, yeah, it does. Oh, sure. All you have to do, uh, are you, all the, proteins have to do is form covalent bonds with certain residue, with certain um, uh, places in the, in actually in, in the, in the bases themselves, they'll form covalent bonds here and they'll undergo a conformational change and they'll break the hydrogen bonds that occur here. Those are hydrogen bonds there. And they break those. Again, those are weaker than the covalent bonds that, that are the backbone structure. So, yes, and this is very common that you can get this untwisted. Otherwise, you'd have a lot of free DNA floating around and biology wouldn't like that because it's taking a lot to put that together again properly to realign and everything. And it's, it's, it would be too messy for it, but yeah, it does. Without, you, it, you don't have to unzip it. I think that's what you're getting to. You don't have to unzip. You can actually just slightly uh, rotate the, the helix here. If you think about that, if you have any, any kind of a double helix that's held together by weakly, if you break those bonds in here, you can untwist the coil slightly. I see. Yeah. yeah you're break right. Them apart, right? That's what's happening. Yeah. Good. good it, point. It's really easy to denature DNA and to get it to, to separate it. And it becomes very much like, like a juicy spaghetti when, when you break some of these uh, hydrogen bonds. It's not strong like steel cable. Yeah. yeah they're, much, they're much weaker than the covalent bonds. That's, yeah. It's, it's not, but, but they're there and they're there for a purpose and, they're, and they are necessary for biology. Okay. Hey, Dick, well, well, there's a lull. Has, yeah. has the stuff about, you know, uh, 
uh, untwisting and things like that been confirmed with uh, uh, crystallography and 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 other uh, other techniques? Oh yes, much more detail than I'm giving you here. They can, 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 labeled... I, can I give you a little a little more detail in medicine? Uh, when people have, a, have bronchitis, they have lots of white cells and, and they break down in the airway and, and the DNA is scattered about and it's, it's kind of uh, very uh, thick, it's viscous. And uh, there's a medication, DNAs, that the people can, can inhale and it breaks the hydrogen bonds and the DNA becomes like this mushy spaghetti and easy to cough up. So it's, it's available at your local CVS. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, uh, Peter's point about the um, about the actual. Let's see. Actually, can can this be seen with say X-ray crystallography? Yes. Not only that, now the technique is X-ray crystallography and magnetic resonance spectroscopy. We've got one or two people in the group I know they're experts at that, but they're using that too. So we know exactly which amino acids on. Uh, located where on these proteins are interacting with the say the guanines of the PAM region to cause this untwisting to occur. And yes, and the and and the the actual um, little bubble here that's formed has a name, and there's an actual particular loop that forms. That loop has a name, and there are several loops that can happen, and those loops have names. So yes, they are well studied, well well characterized now. So we know exactly, exactly. I shouldn't be that that strong, but anyway, know pretty well what the uh, organic chemistry that's going on between the amino acids of the proteins and the DNA uh, bases is that happens. So it's been well characterized. Okay, so there's there's very little doubt that this is happening. And just to confirm what what I think you're talking about. At the end of the process, the scaffolding is broken as well, so that the the strand is complete and the the new the new construction is intact and biologically correct. Is, am I accurate? Um, I'm I'm not I'm not clear about the question. When you talk about the scaffolding, the scaffolding of what? What do you mean by scaffolding? Peter, your microphone is muted. Much better now. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, uh, the, um, double helix is, is a scaffold thing. Is, is, is our, 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 can, our scaffold scaffolds that are that are that are spirals? Correct. Okay. Interact. Okay. And that's what I'm calling the, okay. the scaffolding. Okay. So in, if I'm looking at this picture, it seems to me that somehow what I'm calling the scaffolding, the, the, the spirals, yeah. are somehow have to be broken. So this new uh, chunk of genetic material can be inserted and then the, spa the scaffolding is now complete with this new sequence inserted into it. Okay, you're, you're uh, two... You're two uh, pictures ahead of me with that. Okay. I haven't gotten there I, yet. Okay, I haven't okay. To that point yet. Uh, all right, good. You're absolutely right. right. You're right, but I haven't gotten there. All right. I'll yeah. be patient. <laughs> You'll see it when it comes up. There we go. Um, okay. All right. So now we have this, this, um, what's called melting because we're breaking the hydrogen bonds. Uh, PAM has been recognized. The seed region, which is the beginning region of the, um, what was the spacer portion of the phage, which is the stuff that's being interrogated now in the DNA, is now beginning to find its complementary nucleotide forming hydrogen bonds. This happens. And so this now marches down here. So you're so if it if this happens, then we get to this point. So you start to, to look to see whether it can make these hydrogen bonds form with the seed region. If it doesn't, if it doesn't happen, 
then what then we go back to this skin and this actually will fall off and interrogate another PAM site. So remember this was we had two way reactions here. If you don't get this condition, we go backwards. Here, if we don't get this condition, the PAM site would go back here and so forth. And if we don't get this condition, it goes back. So there's a constant uh, interrogation, looking, trying to see if the if uh, recognition is proper, and there's there's a there's a sequence of recognitions that go on. So there's two or three different recognitions that are happening, and this goes on to this point. You see here it says a stable R loop. Again, the loop has been designated. It's a particular loop that forms. In other words, the geometry is well known, and they now labeled it. Um, so now, uh, as we said, we've got this unwinding and, and what's called the R loop expansion, which is starting from here and just going along, and that becomes an R loop. There was a D loop to form first, but now, and I haven't labeled, I haven't labeled, or I did, this cartoon doesn't have it, but that's what goes on. So now we have, uh, it says the PAM proximal mismatches. That means we don't get matches here, enough of them. So that means we'll go backwards. Okay, I mean, the, what this, phrase refers to as that direction. Okay, so now we've gotten here. Now we've gotten the seed portion going on. And now we're going to go on to the rest of the, um, the spacer and make sure that it also can form hydrogen bonds. In other words, we keep, this keeps unwinding. We're forming the um, <clears throat> hydrogen bonds here. And this does begin to twist. This portion here does begin to twist now back into the uh, conformation as if it were DNA. And, and the other portion just sits out kind of unwound. It, it's twisty, but it's unwound to some extent. It sits off by itself, um, a scant, so to speak. Uh, okay, so we go here, and, and now we've got the whole thing. We've got hydrogen bonds all along here now. And once that happens, then this H and H that started off here has now been uh, moved over here because of the protein uh, conformational change and it will make a cleavage here on the target strand. At the same time, this particular nucleation site, which is in the nuke, is now brought into um, uh, position on the complementary strand and it cleaves. In this particular uh, system, the cleavage occurs three nucleotides from the CAM, from the PAM site. So it's in what was the seed region, which again is part of the uh, target region. And the cleavage occurs and that cleavage is the covalent bonds. So now we've got a free three prime end on, uh, over on this side and a free, uh, a, a free five prime end over here. Um, that's not really true, but that's the way we can uh, conceive of it. And I'll talk about why it's not true, what goes on if it's not true, which is tr it's not always the case. That cleavage isn't perfect. It's perfect in the sense of it's being right across from each other and three nucleotides from the PAM region. Now, this is key. The PAM distal mismatches, in other words, distal, which is means next to the PAM, close to the PAM. If there are mismatches that occur down here, more than four mismatches. By mismatch, I mean, instead of having a uh, um, thymine cytosine uh, hydrogen bond, it doesn't see that. The thymine that was at a particular position here does not see a cytosine over here at C uracil, let's say. It may go on because its neighbors did hydrogen band or can hydrogen bond. So it may go on and, and look for some more. Um, but if there's more than four of these mismatches, in other words, it's not, um, not in register, it doesn't have perfect uh, fidelity, then cleavage does not occur and the cast system falls away and looks for some other site. But it says greater than four. In other words, it does tolerate some mismatches. 
All right. So that, to me, that's critical. That's things that uh, I would say the majority of people, particularly if, if you're not familiar with the, with the field, uh, are, fail to appreciate. They think that CRISPR is perfect, and it's not. But biology is never perfect either. The way biology works is never perfect. There's always mismatches. It's very common, it's very typical. In your cells, there's lots of mismatching going on to get corrected. It happens all the time. It happens, it's happening right now, hundreds of times in your cells. Is that analogous to the mutations that we hear about when, when, when people talk about viruses? That's one example. Mutations is one example. Your, your cells are under, your, your DNA is undergoing mutations all the time and it's being monitored all the time for those mutations. And most of the time, the mutations are corrected. In other words, there's other systems that have come in, taken out that bad, bad, the, the uncoupled, uh, un um, hydrogen bonded uh, nucleotide, taken that out and put the proper one in, it reads the complementary strand, sees what it should be and puts that in. That happens all the time. But Peter, so this is, this it's is not a perfect, it's not perfect. This is a probability um, test. This yeah. would be one in 16 uh, that it would be four in a row. So yeah, it's a probability test. That's the best probability. I mean, it's much more complicated than that. But yeah, if you want to do it strictly on the one to 16, yeah, that's what you get. But that's not, that's not, that's not how biology works. Um, right. There's lots of things that happen with mutations. I'm not going to get into any of that to speak of here. But just to say, yes. for example, you can, you can, alleviate mutations from the fact that you have, in several cases, you have more than one portion of the genome that codes for the same uh, protein. So there's a protein that's really necessary. There's probably more than one place on the genome that has the uh, DNA sequence uh, from which the protein is, it can be made, in other words, transcribed and translated. That's one way to get rid of muta uh, to, to alleviate mutations. You get a mutation in one site, but not in the other site, and you're fine. It it's, Im it's important that there be some errors. Otherwise, we would never have evolved from single cells. Yeah, you could, it, it happens that way, but also it happens because we are having viruses invade, and they carry DNA, and that DNA gets into our genome. So they're carrying it. So a lot of the mutations that happened today came from uh, viruses that came into our cells and got, uh, got incorporated into our cells. So it comes from, you're right, it does happen because of mutations and the mutations could be um, uh, to our benefit. They're beneficial mutations rather than, than uh, bad mutations. And that's true, but they also, you also get a lot of, uh, of the evolutionary change of new DNA sequences coming from outside the cell. And of course, uh, the vast majority of the mutation changes are not desirable and result in not being passed on. That's correct. Uh, you're right. Yeah, that's right, Bob. Dick, you, you, when, you, when you were talking about this, you said that the, the searching goes on, you know, the searching goes on very fast. You know, it, it checks to see if it finds a match, if it doesn't, it just moves on. And, you know, theoretically, that isn't in humanly measurable time in, in terms of, of, of that process. Has, has that been documented? As, is there evidence of that process going on where people have, have actually watched the, uh, the search, you know, or, or in, in some way it have it moved down the, uh, the genome? Yeah, I think and, I know what you're... Yeah, I think I know what you're getting at. No, it hasn't been seen per se. In other words, what you have to do in order to perform that experiment is you have to, you have to label, let's say the CAS system, let's say. You have to label it somehow. Um, there's lots of different kinds of labels out there. The most common today is the fluorescent probe that gets attached. And, and there's lots of fluorescent probes now out there and they can get attached to that to that system. Now you also have to label the DNA. So you've got to know what the position is of the CAS system relative to the DNA. To the DNA. So you've got to have these probes attached. They've got to be relatively close to each other so you can discern this distance because you're talking about uh, nanometers. Well, several nanometers. 
of movement here. So it's a very, very tiny movement. So you got these probes now, and you've got them on two different places, both on the DNA and on the protein, and now you gotta watch them move. That experiment has not been done because it is technically very, very difficult. The probes themselves probably, in many cases, um, cause conformational changes, both of the DNA and of the protein. And so the proteins and the DNA won't carry out the functions you want them to carry out. That's been pretty well um, taken care of. And so, yeah, the probes now work and they're, and they're using them or getting lots of good data from them. So that aspect of it has been solved pretty well. But just uh, because, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, but, but just because of the sheer um, size, the sheer area that you're looking at, first of all, because you're looking at very, very tiny, tiny, tiny movements. And you just can't see that microscopically uh, in, in, in real time. Now you could do it um, with electron microscopy, which is magnifying more, but, the, but to do that, you have to, you have to freeze, you have to be, well, yeah, be nature. You have to, you have to fix the system and it no longer is viable. So you can take a picture, but you're not gonna get the next one in that, in that thing, but you can do sequential different ones and you see what happens. So you get some sense. So the way that they that they that this is happening, it's not it's not being measured the way that we'd like to see it, the way that that, that, you're, that you'd like to see it, Peter, and I would too. I mean, I, we'd all would like to see this happening, but we're not seeing it. What happens? You're looking at <clears throat> how many of these changes we can see <clears throat> over a period of time. So let's say within an hour, how much of this happens, and we know the sequences, we know what's going on, and so just how many happen in a given length of time, that tells you. Uh, and, and we know, you know what, what the um, NGG sequence is and where it occurs. So we can tell how many of these breaks occur, let's say in an hour, um, which means that it has found it, the whole target region, this whole thing has been found and cleavage has occurred, but that's how you do it. So the inference is from the number. And the reason I say it's, it's relatively rapid there are other systems for cleaving DNA, and I'm going to get into that in the, in the next slide or two. Um, this system uh, happens to be relatively fast compared to those other systems. So that's the reason I say it's, it's, that this is fast. Uh, in terms of numbers, let's say per second, I don't know. I, I don't know what that number is. So going through these six steps, if you will, is this measured in nanoseconds or in microseconds or in picoseconds, hours, weeks, days? Oh, uh, let's see. It's not going to be hours. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the number is. I would say it's going to at least be in probably microseconds anyway. Nanoseconds, I don't think so. It could be. I mean, the functioning is going on in nanoseconds. There's no doubt about that. I mean, these, some of the, these actions are going on in nanoseconds. That's true. But in terms of actually recognizing, seeing it doesn't work, and then going off, that's going to be longer than nanoseconds. So it's going to be probably microseconds, maybe yeah. milliseconds. Just, just so to put context in where my head is at, yeah. I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of biological computing and, uh, yeah. and, and the ability to... Uh, to do this stuff and yeah. how it compares to mechanical computing that we use today. Yes. Yeah. But remember, well, of course this happens in mechanical computing. You can stack this. In other words, you can have many, 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 many billions of these going on simultaneously. So yeah, you I mean, it's beyond, to... beyond my understanding, but I'm just, I, you know, yeah. I understand it like up to here, you know, and, and the world is way down here. Oh, that's great. You know, I agree with it. Yeah, no, it's, it's fantastic thinking about this. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, we're not going to talk about this today, but there is a lot of work being done in the, in the realm of using biology for, for computing. And the reason is because of the nature of the information contained in DNA particularly, I mean, proteins too, but DNA is what, where, the, where the locus uh, for the research is being done now. The fact that you've got these four DNA bases that are, that are unique 
and they interact the way they do um, has lent itself to computing. And if you remember from the presentation I gave last time, um, talking about <clears throat> information theory. Information theory is applied in computing, of course, in, 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 uh, in, in, in the computing realm. It's also uh, applied here. It's just more recently being applied from the sense of, uh, of using it as a computer. But it's the same kind of concept, information content. And, and this information is, is, really, is really quite unique. And it can be fast in the sense then if you can get, if you get that kind of, of correspondence, it's as, it, it can be fast. It won't be as fast as the electrical signals. In other words, electron movement, it'll never be that fast. But it's, it's fidelity. It, it can be comparable anyway to what you get. We're nowhere near there. The, the um, electronic uh, solid state systems are much better than biological systems, but the biological systems are being actively investigated for this purpose. So we will, I think, we will have sometime in the future biological computers and carrying on the same kinds of computations as the computers today. Now, where quantum computing comes in, I'm not sure. I don't know what's going to happen there, but we, nobody knows at this point how that's going to work out. Yeah, well, well beyond the scope of this talk is that we have a biological computer between our ears. And that's, that's like the holy grail. Well, that's a different system. And we can talk about that sometime, the way that, that, the, the, way that the neurological system works, the computer of, of our brain. Yeah, we, we can talk about that. Some, but that's different than this. But yeah. Okay, anything else at this point? Good, 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 good discussion. I love it. Anything else? Okay, now we're going to go on to the third system where we get to, to genetic engineering. Um, let me start off with, um, in a sense, tearing apart the CRISPR situation. You've got two main requirements for CRISPR to work. One, the first one is the RNA part. The second part is the Cas system proteins. In the RNA, you've got to have one or more RNAs, you have to have an RNA containing the, the CRISPR that is, yeah, the CRISPR sequence, these, this um, uh, dyads or repeats that forms the, the uh, palindromes. And that's formed both from the tracer and the CRISPR RNA. And as, and as I said, uh, in the uh, bacterial immune system, they're separated from each other. They work in conjunction on the Cas system, but they are separated. But it has been found um, in the lab that they can be covalently bonded together. And that makes it a lot easier to put them together. And they will work with the, with the Cas system when they're covalently bonded together. Now I make this point here. So let me start with this or variation thereof. It was found early on that you could put any sequence that you uh, were interested in, in this region that had the seed and remaining sequence. In other words, the dyads or, or, or the repeats, yeah, you can change those. And we'll, we'll, you know, I guess I'm, let me mention that now. There's lots of research in all of these. That's why I'm going through this because there's a tremendous amount of research looking at the variations you can get in these and what it does. And can it be used for our for, for benefit uh, uh, in terms of looking at other cells or looking at other places to make uh, uh, DNA cleavages. Okay, it happens. But early on, it was recognized that you could make any sequence that you were interested in as the seed and remaining sequence. In other words, the sequence that causes those, fighter, those final hydrogen bonds, the, the this the sequence here, uh, the sequence here, this whole thing here, that can be genetically engineered, and and if you have a sequence that you want to probe, you can genetically engineer that, attach it to this region, and it will work. The Cas system will well use that and will carry out this process. 
Why do you call that genetically engineered? The engineering, okay. The reason it's called genetic engineering is because you're doing something to it from outside. You're engineering it. You are causing it to do something that doesn't naturally do by itself. You've done something. It, it, uh, uh, biology isn't going to just willy-nilly add, add this. You've done it from outside. You've engineered it. A human has done this. The biological system by itself didn't do it. So a lot of the cleavage, a lot of things that change in the body, cleavages, and we'll get to what Peter was asking about, um, and, and, and changing mutations, that's called genetic engineering. You're changing it from outside. That's the engine. So, so in a way, I see what you mean. I mean, this is all genetic engineering, but it didn't seem to me that the seed itself was genetically engineered. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's jargon. It's just like any field. In physics, you, we have a lot of jargon. Oh, in no. molecular biology, we have a lot of jargon. Really not. What's that? Surely not. <laughs> oh, yes, we do. Uh, yes, we do. You talk to, you, you, I talk to my son who is in film and I come up and I give him a, a term that to me is just so common in physics. And what does that mean? Well, he's had physics obviously in high school. But other than that, what does that mean? Sure, all fields have jargon. Every field has jargon. Okay, I 100% I, I, I believe that. And I will argue with you if, 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 if you don't think easy. it does. Sure it does. We, we, we make this stuff up as we go along. I'm trying to think something in physics. Uh, black holes. That's jargon. What the black hole? It's jargon. Okay, we hey, can- Charlie, physicists hey. just talk in code to keep everybody else in the dark. <laughs> well, that's what some people think. It works, doesn't it? <laughs> but it is. Huh? <laughs> uh, okay, so- so this, so we can uh, change that, and that has been done, and that's that's really where CRISPR has made major advances. This was first shown, let me think, in about ten years ago, and five or six years ago is when it really started to be used, and so that's all the time. It, it's 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 accepted now that you change that and you use the CRISPR system. Um. Like I say, you can change these two, and what will happen is that you change how the CAS system works by changing the, 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 the diet or repeats you put in. Now, the CAS system itself, okay, has to be capable of incorporating this, what's called a signal. Remember, the SGI had or a guide, what we call gRNA. And, this, and, and the signal and guide, again, has to contain this CRISPR-like sequence and has to contain the semen complementary, okay? But the system has to be capable of doing that. So um, investigators are looking at that aspect of it and changing it and seeing what it does to systems. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that they've, that they've discovered. I don't know everything, but I know a few things that have happened. Um, secondly, this CAS system has to recognize the PAM sequence in DNA, which is on the complementary strand to the target sequence. This is unique to the CAS system. Uh, I'm pretty sure that there's no other system that's been uh, found yet. And I know they're, they're, they're not looking for it in bacteria uh, and, in, and in eukaryotic cells or cells of like in humans. Um, they're looking for it, but it, it, it has not been, nothing's been found like this. And this is unique in the sense that this is a place where the CAS system is going to look at first and if it doesn't find a secret, it just quickly goes on to the next place. This, this is quite different, but it, it, it's, it's very, um, uh, uh, it, it's very actively investigated. There are different PAM sequences that have been found in biology. In other words, different bacteria have different PAM sequences. So you can engineer, you can change those by human changes of the of the recognition sites. Uh, so yeah, so the PAM itself is different. They're short, they're maybe four or five at maximum. I, the largest I've seen is eight or nine. They're, they're pretty short sequences. Thirdly, you gotta uncoil, remember that, that, that breaking of those uh, hydrogen bonds, you gotta uncoil the DNA when the, when the sequence is recognized. So this is a sequential pattern. 
So again, that's looked at to see on that coin because that is that is from an engineering standpoint, let's say from a physics or a mechanical engineering standpoint, that's quite important to have it proper. And yeah, they're looking at this to see see what it does, what it changes, if it helps you, if it hurts you, and what you're trying to accomplish, and so forth. Uh, the cast system also has to allow the seed to interrogate in the form of hydrogen bond. So this is the first thing that happens. This short, like it's about a 10 nucleotide in the one I showed you, about a 10 nucleotide sequence that interrogates first to see if the hydrogen bonds. So this, the, the, it, it's, it's a two-step process. The first one is the seed portion of the initial portion to see if it does. If it does, then it goes on to, to do this. If it didn't, then they would fall off. But now, okay, it's gotten the first 10. Okay, let's go on. And it'll go on. And if all this works out, then we can go on to have cleavage of the covalent bond and at the appropriate location of the target DNA. Again, in the one I showed you, it's three nucleotides from the, from the PAM region and also causes cleavage of the covalent bond at the appropriate location. The complementary, in other words, the other side, the other, the other uh, uh, DNA, which is complementary to the target DNA, in other words, the, the second, um, uh, we used to call them the Watson, the Crick strands. I think Jerry said sense and anti-sense last time, but and, you know, they're the same thing. It's the other strand, okay? Um, now, a couple of things that, I, that uh, I wanna mention here. First of all, there's different caste systems. Uh, oh, before I actually get to that, let me make a big point. Caste system only occurs in bacteria. Eukaryotic cells do not have, as far as we know up to this point, a, a caste system. Our immune system is very different than bacterial systems. The bacteria made this caste system as it's one of its major reasons, or at least the way we've discovered it, as an immune system for the bacteria. It has other, it, now that it's been investigated a lot, it has other activities, but the major activity that everybody investigated and looked at, yes, was, was for um, immunity. We do not use it. Our cells do not have a CAS system, as far as we know to this date. They, it can be introduced, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, into our cells, but we do not have it in our cells. Secondly, there are different caste systems. So there's one caste system. Um, I had cast nine before. There's a caste system 12A that's been found in some bacteria. That one only uses the CRISPR RNA. It does not use tracer RNA for its activity. And it cleaves DNA at different sites so that the target strand is cleaved in one place. In other words, the covalent bond is broken in one place, but the complementary strand is broken in another position, upstream or downstream from the, uh, where the um, target strand was uh, broken. And this breakage takes place between 18 and 23 nano, uh, I'm sorry, nucleotides from the PAM region. In other words, farther down into that spacer sequence. And that just tells you that there are lots of different caste systems. They all have different activities. They all work differently. There is a caste system that also um, breaks RNA. In other words, it acts on RNA. It's another RNA, it acts on, it, it acts on a, a complementary, let's call it RNA, and breaks that one. So there's lots of different CAS systems. Um, okay, let me see how it's at this point. I'm probably leaving something up. I don't know what it is. Anyway, going on. In addition to the strand cleavage, which was what we had before, and it's, it's called breaking or scission. In, in, okay, that's the jargon that goes on in molecular biology. Gene editing, which we're going to get into now, uh, uh, requires strand joining. Now, this is something that Peter brought up about you're trying to correct a mutation, you're trying to put something in, that you need strand joining. 
And strand joining uh, has been has been looked at for decades. It's sometimes called repair or recombination. Uh, these are just terms are used, but that's what they mean. You're joining the strands. And this is done by uh, basically two techniques, the homologous and non-homologous techniques. And I'm gonna uh, go into some discussion of them in the next slide. So that's the other side of genetic engineering. As far as I'm concerned, genetic engineering has two major investigative uh, targets. One is cleavage. You wanna cleave it, cleave the DNA out at a particular place for whatever reason. And secondly, you want to insert uh, nucleotides at a specific region. Those are two separate uh, things that can work in conjunction with each other um, if, you, if you make the experiments correct. Uh, and the cells do this all the time. Um, um, but it's done, but, but I, I, I think it's, it's best to consider it as two separate um, genetic, what I call genetic engineering approaches. Um, and we're gonna talk about that in a bit. Uh, there have been previous gene editing tools for scission. Uh, just, this is for historical purposes here, I just wanna um, wrap this up a bit. Uh, one was called zinc finger nucleases or ZFN and the other was transcription activator like effective nuclear talon. Those were uh, uh, systems that also were able to look at target sequences on DNA and, and there were nucleases that were associated with these uh, two systems that could then cleave once the target sequence was located, then you had you could get cleavage of DNA. Um, they have been under investigation at least for 30 or 40 years. And you didn't see much in the literature and particularly popular literature in, uh, going toward medical because they just were not that precise. They, it took a lot of time for them to, to occur. The technology was cumbersome at best to make them work. They did work, but it was cumbersome that everybody kept trying to make them better. And I'm sure people are still, are still working in, these, in the fields using these things, but CRISPR has overtaken it in terms of where you want the cleavage to occur. And the reason is CRISPR appears to be better because it uses the PAM, because it interrogates very quickly and then moves on. And it uses the seed plus the, uh, the other part of the sequence for targeting. In other words, it's, it's much more precise than these two are for the actual region in which you wanna have the breakage uh, or scission to occur. And they contain their own nucleases. You didn't have to add them by an engineering, let's say, approach. They already had the nucleases part of them. That was one of the big things that the CAS system had that nobody had seen before. It had its own nucleus. It, it recognized and had its own nucleus. So that, that's the reason why that um, uh, took place. Um, there's a number of, like I said, there's a lot of, a lot of work being done in this field, trying to make this better. And it's, it's ongoing, active, billions of dollars is being spent all over the world um, invest in doing this. Now. It's, 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 it's exciting. Um, but I, I, I put a caution, I guess. it's not gonna be the best thing since sliced bread for a while. Uh, and the caution is because um, biological systems, again, are not 100%, they're not perfect. Uh, you have errors all the time that happen. In our system, in, in our biology system, as we, as we have briefly spoken about here, we have errors occurring all the time, and that's good, it's part of biology. And so when you try to harness bio, uh, biological systems, you have to take that into account, this is gonna happen. And so you have to somehow get the best, uh, best result that you're after without sacrificing the, the, um, the bad or the deleterious results. So as an example, let's say there's a particular um, DNA sequence that you wish to, to cleave. Um, but if you have, if, if the sequence you're trying to cleave has a sequence which is somewhat similar to some other sequence in the whole genome, and that sequence has, let's say, uh, similar enough that there's less than four nucleotide uh, difference between the two sequences, then the Cas system is going to cleave 
both of them probably with the same um, uh, same frequency. And you didn't want the second one to be craved. You wanted the first one only. So those are the sorts of things you have to take into, or you know, research that people have to take into consideration. And that's why it's gonna take a while for this to really get to the clinic. It will happen, but you're gonna to have to go through all this and, and make it work. I'm, I'm just, what I'm doing is, is sort of alerting to you, alerting you what's happening behind the scenes now in this field. That's uh, a lot of work, a lot of work to do that. And I, hopefully, uh, I'm, I'm trying to raise awareness for appreciation of that it's not perfect, but it, it's great. It's a good, it's a good thing. Uh, I mean, it, it's come along to be something very exciting, um, and, and I and I fully uh, agree with that excitement that's happened because the the talent and the zinc thing are just uh, were not working well. All right, now let's go on to the second part, and this is the repair of of uh, DNA um, or inserting other parts of DNA into the system. In this one, I'm only gonna talk about repairs that, that occur. Uh, and and this, is, this happens in our cells. Um, there are two, two basic systems for repairing brakes. Okay, we've got the brakes. You can get the brakes lots of different ways. Um, one is the non-homologous repair. And the second one is homologous repair. Now, this cartoon that I have here isn't, isn't perfect, but it's the best one I could find that I could put on the same slide with what goes on. Uh, so I can see both of these and talk about both of these aspects here. Okay, let's talk about the non homologous repair uh, first, uh, uh, which is over here. So on the left side, it's NHEG, which stands for non homologous end joining. So we're going to join these two ends together. That's what NHEG stands for, but it's non-homologous repair. So uh, the first thing that, that, that is considered, we've got the break occurring here, DNA cleavage may leave overhangs. By overhangs, that means that you could have a little, you could have a nucleotide or two sitting here, or you could have where you don't have, it. it's not a, it's not a, a pure uh, five prime hydroxyl or three prime hydroxyl, it may not be there. So enzymes come in and they look at this and they clean it up. Okay, so the enzymes come in, they trim it off, and they they, they make this somewhat clean. You see here what's happened is they've cleaned. They've you got to tell me. You got to tell me what homologous means. Yeah, we'll get to that. I, I left that out until we get we get to homologous here. It, well, it, we've it, only used it seven times so far. Yeah, just okay. Let me let me just say it's not I'll homologous without telling you what homologous is because. Homologous, when we get to that, it will, it will take a little bit of discussion. Um, so just hold that in abeyance, Charlie, if, if you will, just for five minutes or less. Okay. And we'll, we'll get to it. There are lots of different um, proteins, uh, factors that come in. They're mostly protein factors. Some are enzymes, some are not. Some recognize, some recruit other proteins. So There's a whole family of proteins that come in and work on this. So they get these two uh, ends ready to join. And that's what their point, that's what their purpose is. They're, they're trimming it, they're making it uh, uh, able to now join together. Um, so that's what they do. And that's what's happening here. Now we've got some other ends that they are going to put it together. So the processing has occurred, getting ready to join. And what happens down here is they join. So the enzymes join the ends and they're called ligases, the ones that actually do the joining that make, okay, this one is gonna to join to this, just like covalent bonds are all formed here. Perfect, those are ligases. Um, now, as you can see, there are, you can get gaps here. You can have uh, this happen and you can be trimming so that you actually leave some of these nucleotides that used to be here in the parent, used to be there, are gone. They do not get replaced. They are gone. Okay, the DNA is joined together, but what was there to begin with is gone. In non-homologous repair, that's common. That's very typical. It happens almost all the time. It's very rare. I, I'm not aware of any situation that I've heard of. I'm sure there, are, there is maybe one or two where you could have, uh, let's say the CAS system came in and made a, a, an exact uh, breakage here 
and then non-homologous repair came in and joined it together perfectly. I've never seen it happen here. There's something that goes on with these things and they'll cleave off some of those nucleotides. So it never works together. Um, okay, now uh, Charlie, let's go to homologous repair. Homologous meaning similar or the same. That's what homologous means. In, in homologous repair, which is the HR here, okay? there's a homologous DNA sequence. The sequence is very similar, if not the same, as the target sequence, okay? A homolog, it's something that's very similar, if not the same. That's what homolog means. That's homologous. Um, in the homologous situation, again, we have some enzymes that come in and they recognize that there's been a break here and they start to work on it. But now they know that there's this lurking homologous DNA sequence around here that we can use to help in the repair. And so what happens here is that, you, is that this particular group of enzymes actually does a lot more trimming and it will trim away a lot more say of this strand has happened here leaving this a much longer portion of the complementary strand. Um, you can get the same thing happening on this side. And in this case, what will happen is that you'll get a lot of this taken off and a lot of this remaining. And again, it's because of the way that the repair uh, system of enzymes looks at it. It knows which direction to cleave off these nucleotides to make it so it's susceptible now to homologous repair. They recognize this. So their process to remove the unnecessary material and form single strand. So they have fairly large single strand, what's called overhangs. Or it overhangs because it doesn't, it it, it's not capable of hydrogen bonding to anything up here. So that's why they're called overhangs. Now we've got the homologous strand that sits here. And the system recognizes that. So the complementary DNA uh, piece invades the broken DNA to form a template for, uh, for a DNA polymerase. Um, okay, now this part of the, of the cartoon is kind of difficult to, to, uh, to see, to understand, to begin with. Um, this particular portion of the homologous sequence rotates out of the way. Again, this takes energy, but it does happen and it does open up to say, it unwinds this to some extent. So allows this strand to actually come in at this point. And this, this strand here is actually uh, sequentially uh, homologous to where it, let's let's say it's the same. Let, just for sake of argument, let's say it's exactly the same. It's the same as this strand. They are the two same strands. Okay, I mean they're, they're the two different DNA duplexes, but they have the same sequence. I guess maybe that's the best way to say that. That sequence is the same as that sequence. So this one invades and it forms hydrogen bonds with the complementary sequence. Okay. This one rotates out of the way. Now, what happens is since it's formed these hydrogen bonds here, a DNA polymerase comes in and it adds nucleotides complementary to these. Okay, it comes along here and adds nucleotides to that point. Okay, now those nucleotides, obvious, not obviously, those nucleotides can hydrogen bond to that, but if you notice, they're also complementary to this strand up here on the, on the uh, DNA that had been cleaved to begin with. So it goes on for a while here and eventually it stops um, because it recognizes it's got a, a number of nucleotides the same. How it does that, I, I don't know, but it does. And so it stops after a while. And so, it, so this particular strand now comes off 
and it can hydrogen bond with that. This strand now comes back to its original site and goes on with that DNA. And what happens here is that we've got this, but now we have added, we don't have that sequence uh, put together yet, but since we already have hydrogen bonding here, hydrogen bonding here, there's only this gap that's only on this strand and there are enzymes now that will come along and look at the complementary strand uh, here and form it together and so that you come back and you now have the uh, parent strand is now come back together and it's been repaired. Uh, it's an, it, my, uh, my syntax is a bit inelegant on that, but hopefully, hopefully I've been able to convey how this, how this happened. Uh, there's lots of uh, YouTube videos on that and they all, I, I've, gone through four, five, six of them, and they all do the same sort of thing as I do. You kind of am and haw about it. It's not, it's not simple. Um, anything you want me to go through again so that you understand how this is working? Does that help Charlie with homologous? Charlie? He may have stepped away. Oh, okay. Uh, does anybody else have has a question about homology? Homologous. Not about homologous, but I've got a question about um, is it is is one of these uh, double one of these I'll call them double helixes actually stealing nucleotides from the other? No, nucleotides. So where, they, so where are they coming from to make the repair? Well, in biology, in in the in the system, you have free floating nucleotides in your cells all the time. Okay. So any kind of repairs go on, it's there, they're big things. Uh, the biological models are being, are being formed and broken down all the time. So okay, yeah, there are free nucleotides out there. No, that might be that them, there right? was some DNA that was not being used and that got, that got chewed up, freeing up some nucleotides and those are being used. Okay, it's like, um, like we're trying to get our rubbish, you know, recycled. Yeah, that happens all the time in biology. Okay. So yeah, so so they are out there. They don't come from they don't come from the other strand. No, they're 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 out there. No. So Dick, on, in the non-homologous re repair. Yes. We we have a new gene, I guess we'll call it, or DNA that has a it's complete, but there's a gap. So there's 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 missing pieces to it. Mm -hmm. Is that defective? and then is destroyed by the system? Or why would you want to make a, uh, why would the body want to make a repair like that if it doesn't have, if it's incomplete information? I guess yeah. is the best way I can phrase it. Yeah, good, good, good point, good question. Um, and let me amplify it a little bit. Um, in our system in the eukaryotic cells, that's the most common repair mechanism that's done. Non-homologous, that's the most common. In our system, it's most common. And yes, you do get, um, let's say that you start off, I think, what, I think what you're getting to, which is pretty, you know, pretty, pretty good thing is you might say there's a gene here and some, something happened and caused a, a breakage in this gene. And so during the repair mechanism, you don't get the gene being reformed exactly the same way as it was before. So therefore that gene, if red has mutation in it, most commonly it's not being red, but let's say it is red, then it's a mutation. So what good is that? Uh, mutation is not good. And yeah, this gets chewed up. It's not uncommon for this to be recognized as not being useful. So, so it gets chewed up, this, the cells recognize that and gets it chewed up. Why okay. that happens Why that happens in our system or in, 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 our, in, in our cells more commonly than this, um, well, one of the reasons why that happens is because you got an homologous, you got to have the homologous DNA in close association with the, with the uh, uh, damaged DNA. And that's not a common situation. It happens sometimes. Um, I'm not going to get into what it happens, but it's not common. I say in terms of time, it's not common. So I, that's why, that's why it happens. You got 
okay, it's best to have this repair and have the whole DNA going on. So maybe there's some other genes out here that are useful. So we got this big piece of DNA. Granted, this one's not useful, but the rest of it is. So that's one reason why this goes on in our system. This was lost. Yeah, can, I, I said, can I put this in the context of something simple like COVID? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you, yeah. Have the, you have the COVID uh, uh, protein that binds to the uh, angiotensin uh, converting enzyme receptor. Right. And that has a receptor binding domain, which is very precise, and it has to be to bind to that receptor. Then right. you got a great big superstructure around that or below it or whatever, uh, which just holds the darn thing together. And if you change one amino acid in that, it doesn't make much difference. It's like a gray brick in a red brick wall. It just doesn't make that much difference. So, a lot, so, so if you repair it and it's not quite precise, it really doesn't make a heck of a lot of difference functionally. And that's the same with our, pro, our proteins as well, is that proteins are very long and they have functional areas and non-functional areas that are just structural. And, they, and the quaternary structure isn't altered that much when you change one or two of them. So uh, that's why, Peter, you can get away with repair. And you know we're all the same, but we all look different. You can get away with repair and have very minor inconsequential changes. Yeah, that is true. There, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be quite as sanguine about about uh, damage and whether it's whether it can be overlooked or not. Um, it, it can be. You're absolutely right. That can be in in the enzymes, but um, and also in recognitions that go on. But um, I, I think there's a lot more instances in, in which it doesn't work, and so it's not being used. But we have systems in our body which can which can compensate for that. Um, you might have, you, like I said, you might have more than one uh, gene, uh, gene, or, or more than one copy of, of a gene. So, okay, so one one copy gets hurt. The other but th th that's how we know we're heterozygous, so because uh, you know you'll have expression of, of both of them. You can see yeah. things that go on that didn't go on in the parents. Yeah. Well, even on the same strand, you can have uh, multiple uh, genes that that are making the same protein. But uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yep. Also, doesn't this get down to where the vast majority of our genome isn't really critically important anyway? It's some ah. so-called non-coding. Okay, we're getting almost 11. I didn't think I'd go to 11.30, but let me go to the last slide. I don't, I don't want to- It's called dark matter. dark matter. Dark matter Dark matter of the genome. Ah! Uh, black you, hole. You, 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 you've hit Charlie my, feels better now. We're talking about you, physics. You've hit my soft spot on that one. Um, there's lots of controversy going on there. Uh, let me, this is the last slide. So let me, let me end here before it gets to be 1130. Um, like I say, we got cleavage. Uh, there's some uh, caste systems now that only cleave one strand. We know that. Uh, we've already got cleavage at different sites and cleaves aren't. I talked about that. Okay. This is the last thing here. And I thought we'd spend a lot of time on this, which we have. But this, let me go through it quickly. Um, where can it be used in, 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 uh, in uh, genetic engineering? One is to make to is one way is to actually identify genes. In other words, if you have a system that's working, you can come in and you can make a cleavage in what you think is a gene. Um, and it makes, let's say the, the system work better. That's because you have cleaved the mutant gene. You can actually edit them. You can, uh, you can remove and modify. Now to, to Peter's point about adding, I didn't, I didn't go into how you can add um, uh, new sequences, but you do it by by that homologous uh, technique. That's how that's how you can add things. So that you start off with a strand that uh, that on two ends uh, is very very similar to a strand that you want to to change, and in the middle you put a gene that you want to add to to that to the parent strand, and so that's what you do. You do a homology. Uh, let me, okay. What you do is you have this area here, which is new. In other words, it's something you've modified, you've engineered. And so when, when you've got this breakage, you can come in and you could add it down. So that's how the mutant or how, or how the change can be made into the DNA. And then that one that goes on, and you can, you can uh, have it uh, uh, duplicate and so forth. The reason this doesn't duplicate is because this has been engineered and so it's not recognized as part of a, of a, a chromatin of a chromosome. So that's in, in 30 words or less, that's how that's how you can do it. So from Peter's point, that's how you make those kinds of mutant changes.
Um, okay, another way, another way is you can identify genes that way. In other words, this is a way of probing. Like I said, you could have fluorescent probes, uh, radioactive probes, and so forth. Um, and so you can actually put those in, okay, by, by uh, homologous repair mechanisms. Uh, this is putting in nuclear uh, sequences. Okay, that's the same thing we're talking about. And then you can target those sequences. You might have something you want to be able to target. And targeting is easy uh, in, in, in relation to a lot of things that go on in, in molecular biology. It's, it's easy to target the DNA. It's easy to target the uh, protein and now um, because we know how to, we, we've made uh, our, our targeting, our target molecules so they recognize that, that area. So that goes on. Um, and then overall, uh, it's just, you get new products diagnosed treat diseases. Um, let me see if there's something else I was gonna say. Uh, oh, one thing we didn't talk about here is the use of, of genetic engineering in cells. Um, there's controversy about whether it should be done. Let's say in humans, let's, let's go right to the human situation. Should it be done in humans? And if it is done for humans, let's say to repair a, mutant, uh, a mutation, should it be done in the uh, what are called somatic cells? And that it, those are the cells that are in your body and they, they remain in your body, they, re, they reproduce in your body, but they remain with you. And those your cells like blood cells, muscle cells, um, nerve cells. Or should they, or, or should we, or should we be able to do it in so-called germ cells? In other words, in the, uh, in the um, stage before the embryos form, should we make the genetic changes there? Um, there's controversy about that. It was done once, and that person's in jail, did it. But uh, it will be done, I think. I think we will eventually do it. We may, may not be in my lifetime, but it will happen. But these are things to, to consider about editing. But this has always been true about gene editing. But uh, with CRISPR now, it's become more, uh, it, it'll, it could happen sooner than it happened before. Some people have to think about it. And there are big groups that have formed to discuss the ethical use of CRISPR. And it's 11.30, so what do you want to do? Well, we can, we can discuss a little bit, bit, little bit longer if you want. Uh, I just have one one question, just maybe it's a short answer. And if it's a long answer, just let me know and we'll talk about it later. The difference between genetic modification, like GMO for, that we hear about for, for foods. Yeah. And, and, the, and what we just talked about with CRISPR. Yeah. Are they, are they different? Are they the same? Same. You're just doing it in, in plants rather than animals, but it works the same way. Plants work the same way as animals <clears throat> from a basic biological standpoint. Yeah, a lot of differences. Okay, we don't have chlorophyll, but you know, other than that sort of thing. Yeah, basic biology is the same in all systems. So, so the yeah. good news is we're all non-GMO animals. Speak for oh. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> actually, exactly. It's, actually, it's almost the contrary. We've all been genetically modified just by evolution. Well, well plants have two. So that's right. right. Yeah. So, we'll look at so, it. It's just that we haven't been engineered. In other words, you know, in my discussion with Charlie, uh, where a human has actively tried to change it in us. Right. Okay. Something right. has happened passively. So, yeah. so, so, Dick, when when you talk about that, when you, uh, the GMO is in, it implies that a human or 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 some external process has modified the organism yes. versus. Uh, natural selection where we we cross two 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 uh plants that are similar yes but so, even that has happened i mean in agriculture this has been going on for centuries yeah, exactly selective breeding is for example how corn got right. extra chromosomes which are amplified and make it bigger yep yep all all that stuff from, and so know. now we're not just doing crossing we're actually getting into the cells and doing things inside the cells and that's where it becomes controversial because right. we don't know what effect this will have on things like food allergies. Yep. I think the concern is not food allergies. The concern is that when you modify a plant, let's say to make it resistant to some, some insect, plants of different species share genes to some extent and you, those genes can be transmitted to the weeds. 
And so you can have all sorts of secondary outcomes that you aren't predicting. It's not that they're dangerous to us, we just cook them. Uh, they, don't, they don't hurt people. It's what, it's going to, what it might <clears throat> have implications to the natural environment that you can't predict and can just ruin industries. Yeah, this is something that happened with past, um, uh, Monsanto has had a big problem with this. Um, what Jerry's pointing out is, is true. There, there's actually two things that go on. When, when, when the modifications are done, in other words, let's say when Monsanto or whoever it is, makes the changes to the genome, let's say, of, uh, of corn, such that it now is, is resistant to the herbicide that kills weeds. Okay, um, they do that and they study it to the point that they know with pretty, pretty, pretty good certainty, not 100%, but pretty good, that the corn itself is not going to be poisonous to us or to planting the corn to, 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 to grow new plants and so forth. But Jerry's point is well taken. They don't consider the fact that the, that the genome of the corn can be through a variety of biological processes uh, transferred to some other plants. And so those other plants now have uh, the herbicide resistance in them. And so those weeds now can grow and take over. Yeah, and so it's the secondary considerations that often are not thought of um, and, and for, for good reason, for bad reason, but for good reason, you don't even think of these things. And also we, as, as our knowledge increases, there are more things that we know. Uh, that happens biologically, and sure enough, they, they, things turn up. So yeah, this is this is. But you both wait. This is this is uh, this is where the dilemma lies. Dick, you sh you should tell the story, which I believe you know. I'm sure you do, about the uh, GMO cornfield next to the organic cornfield, and Monsanto coming in and uh, and starting to ask for monies from the organic farmer. Yeah, but that was litigation. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was what happened. Point. The genes drifted over to the other field. Precisely. Yeah, genes, even just the pollen. Yep. And uh, this is why there has to be great care taken in what gets labeled organic. That well, and it, that it's and all pesticide. organic. That's that. That's another bug of mine. They say organic. Come on, all the food you eat is organic. Come on. Well, you oh, know what, what it's meant. No, no, no what they mean is it's supposed sense. to be good for you. Yeah, I know what you, I, I know. I know what Bob's saying, <laughs> but I, I'm just pulling his life. I always talk. I always talk about <clears throat> being inorganic from the way I eat. <laughs> yeah. Do you eat plastic? Well, Do you eat plastic? Uh, uh, agreed. There is very little inorganic food except for the, except for the plastic <laughs> we all eat. But actually, the plastic is organic materials too. It is. That's it right. Is. Yep. Except for the uh, PFAs. PFAs aren't entirely organic. <laughs> well, they are organic, but they're yeah. not uh, carbonaceous. Yeah, they're fluoroorganics. Yeah. Oh. And there are chloroorganics we ingest also. Yep. But well, some uh, inorganics are good for us. Selenium is good for you. Copper is good for you. Iron is good for you. Yeah. In limited amounts, these micronutrients are good. Okay. In greater amounts, selenium can be poisonous. Yep. My dad was actually poisoned by selenium. Yes. So this, all this talk makes me hungry. I'm going to have to go get some lunch. <laughs>